let's dive into stage four. So again, for recap for listeners, we've stage one, the do now, stage two, the exposition, stage three, the modeling. There's 27 stages, by the way, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Stage three, the modeling, and stage four we're up to now is checking for understanding, right? Just assume you've almost kind of haven't said what you've said before. Just talk us us through this, Craig. What does the check for understanding look like? Yeah, so I'm breaking this down into two two parts people will be happy to hear. So one is questioning, and then one is the responsive teaching, which is going to happen as a result of that. So the the questioning, I've broken down into such minute detail that I'm hoping when when they do show me their answers, I'm able to to intervene at the level I know I need to intervene at. So first question, draw the grid. Next question, would be right here is the grid you should have what are the areas once you've got the areas which is 2x plus 14 it's tempting to think that they're done but they're they're not done they haven't asked the question yet so the third question is then expand the bracket with everything they're written for them what does it actually mean to expand the bracket oh okay i just need to write down 2x plus 14. i've done all the hard work i need to interpret what, what my end product there is so but the questions I wrote down were those three. And then I had one more slide, which just said the word expand and everything else was blank. And that was me. I didn't know what they were going to call that last bit was going yeah. to go. So it gave me the time and space, um, to, to do lots of things, which I'll talk about in a bit, but I think let's go back to those, those first three. Yeah. So explain the purpose, like doing this, need to make sure we can just an independent work shortly. You need to make sure that you can do that by yourself. To do that, and check that you understand what's going on here. Da, 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 da. Um, so if they've if they've got it right, great, success, praise, all those things. If, if they need a few little tweaks, then, then then we'll tweak it. I am in I am in no rush at this stage of the lesson. This is the most important stage. Nothing ends up in their books. I don't care. It ends up in their head. They, they are thinking. I've got the whole class thing. Just for listeners who've just, Um, everything's mini whiteboards. Is this right? All this is taking place. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So that's bit by bit, bit by bit, bit by bit. Um, And then interpreting that result. So then the the final question, which was expand, and then there's nothing there, gives me a chance to do two things. One is to write my own question in response to how well I have gauged they've understood something. But it also gives me a chance, once one question is written with the model, with the grid method, with the answer, is to then change one little part of that question and slowly ramp up the difficulty. So if I start off by writing, okay, we're going to do one question all from scratch now. I want you to expand five brackets X plus two. Show me on your mini whiteboard with the grid and everything. Great. Now, don't grab anything out. I want you to be as lazy and as efficient as possible. I'm going to change one thing in the question. I want you using your finger to rub things out or your pen to add things in to change the least you need to throughout your grid and through your final answer to show me what the answer would be. And then I can change it to, okay, five brackets X minus two, five brackets two X minus two, make the five at the front become negative, you know, whatever it is. Um, And we can do that for a little bit and increase the difficulty. And then at some point, I'm going to want to just reset that because I think at some point they're going to get a bit carried away with, it's going to be really easy, become a bit easy to change one thing, change one thing, change one thing, but they're not actually practicing expanding the entire thing now. So like, okay, right, wipe your boards. Let's do that again with one more cycle. Uh, Ideally, I want the end product to be through using minimally different questions at this stage that they can answer any question that, that, that comes at them. Um, so we might reset and at an appropriate point, I've, I've got two sets of questions that I had ready to go to. One was a set of minimally different questions. There's a great website, you should check it out. It's sort of houses all these things that's like, you know, like 20 questions where one little thing changes each time. Um, I can't remember what it's called. But, um, and then there's uh, another set, which was just grabbed from Corbett, which was just, there was nothing linked to questions at all. And ideally, I wanted that minimally different exposure to happen on their mini whiteboards. And then I wanted them to be ready to independently do the, I don't know what we call them, the maximum Mm. different questions. 
um, independently. That was my plan, but I was I was ready for any sort of scenario at this point. Wow. So we're going to pause it there. So you're going to talk about the response separately to this. So I love this, but I have questions coming thick and fast here. Wow. Um, yeah, this is amazing. This is amazing. So the first question is, what are you doing, Craig? Whilst the kids are writing on the mini whiteboards, do you have time to circulate here, or is it so kind of quick, fast that you're just you're kind of just standing back and just checking everything's going okay. Well, what are you doing whilst the kids are, are, are get preparing their answers? Probably just standing at the front. Um, in this instance, they're quite yeah, quick fire yeah. questions. I don't want people um, not being catered for, and I don't want someone messing around if I can't look at them. Um, so not always the case, but because these are quite quick fire-ish, uh, I'd be at the front for this. Love it, love it. Right. This isn't a question. I just want to tell you something I saw um, the other day that I thought was really, really nice. And it may a question may have come out of my mouth. God, God only knows, but we'll just see. <laughs> so um, they were similar phase of the lesson, but they were doing tree diagrams with a year 10 class. And it was tree diagrams with replacement, uh, no, without replacement. So fairly, fairly tricky stuff. Teacher had done some modeling. And then it was the the kind of your turn. They were doing an example problem pair with the, with, with the your turn on the right hand side. And I'd done a bit of work with them before. And so they were using whiteboards for this, but they used it in a really interesting way. And we talked about how we could improve this after the lesson. So the way they used it was the kids were um, kind of, the, the teacher broke it down. So like um, draw, you know, what what's the first thing you would draw? What would your tree diagram structure look like? So they draw like two branches going off and he'd check and great. Um, what would what would be on those two branches? Put the fractions, check and so on. The problem was, as you got further through this, the boards were getting so complex that it was really hard to to identify. Like by the time you're checking what fractions on the you know the fourth branch or whatever, you can't see it when you've got thirty kids. So what we talked about, I only thought this off the top of my head, but I thought this would work really well. This for for multi step problems like that is, you build up this example step by step on one side of the board, but then you whatever you're asking for you do on the other side of the board to check. So, you know, you build up your tree diagram step by step, but if you're then asked what fraction is on, you know, the end of branch three, just flip over your board, write that fraction nice and big, three, two, one, hold it up. Yeah, that's looking good. Okay, add that to your diagram and so on. So I just thought for more complex things, you can imagine that even working for, you know, expanding double brackets or something where you're cramming quite a lot of information on that board. It's quite nice to do as a little breakdown check, but still be building up that one example. So I just, again, I don't know if you have anything to say about that, but I just thought that was quite quite nice i i agree yeah good, <laughs> That's what I've got to good. Say. right so now i do have a question for you and i know listeners are going to be thinking about this as well no notes have been taken at this point right like there's nothing is there anything in kids books at this stage a few questions from the do now yeah the okay and which is going to be a date. big kind of alarm bell going off in and now i should say for the record no, well, it's interesting. This. What do I think about this? I, I think books are overrated um, as a, as a revision tool. Um, you ask kids, do you revise from books? The answer is no. But what I would say is, if they use them for anything, it may be for worked examples. And what I've often talked about in the past is having a worked examples book, and then your practice book, and even having a contents page. The kids do their own contents in the worked example and so on. So I'm intrigued how they're not even copying down a worked example in yours. So I just wondered if you could talk us through the, the thinking there and if it, if it causes any problems. What would the purpose be in copying down a worked example would be my question. So they've got it to refer um, to while during the practice? So I, I'm i not going to let them start the practice phase until I'm confident that they okay. can do this. Yeah. Yeah. I don't need them referring to it. Also, I know that what's going to happen is when we start the practice phase, I'm going to model after maybe a minute the first answer to the first question on the board. Okay. Um, so they can refer to that if they want. Um, but by that point, they just tick in their own, their own work. Um, I don't think, like you say, students, I'm not sure they not only do, I'm not sure they can use their exercise books for revision. I'm not sure I'd want no. them to. Um, the amount of time and effort it would take to get a set, I'll just buy them a provision book or, or or set them tasks on sparks or set them particular work to, to, to do like yeah the, the idea that anyone ever looks back at work they've done in a useful manner I, I, I just I, I've never seen it work uh, effectively and um, so I don't <laughs> I don't care what's no, in their books I care what's in their heads this is interesting um, I'm with you 100% but 
That being said, I, I, I sometimes do book looks and stuff. Yeah, this is the thing. This is the thing, right? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but, but stuff's coming up that's going to be okay. in their book, oh, and man. I want, and I want, I want quality over quantity. But if I know that a school's ethos is that they're spending the first 10, 15 minutes being modelled without writing it down, and then they're doing checks for staying on a mini whiteboard, I'm happy. If that isn't their ethos, and there's nothing in their books. I'm thinking, well, what, what is happening in this time? Yeah. And I'm gonna go to a few lessons and, and, and find out. I think I've got, by this point, a perfectly justifiable reason as to why their books are almost empty. Um, because they've been thinking and they've been thinking really, really hard. And when they do some work in a second, independently, it's gonna be correct. It's, it's, it's fascinating this. So I, I'm 100% I'm with you on this, but I'm also aware that you, um, that when I visit schools, I know books are a big like thing that SLT want me to look at. And I'm always like, oh, I'm not really that bothered. I just want to see, you know, what the kids know, watch the lesson and so on. I'll tell you my favorite response, right? Because it, it's often a barrier, particularly for mini whiteboard use. Like heads of department will say, look, I'd love to use, I'd love our department to use mini whiteboards more. But the more we do on mini whiteboards, the less work goes in books. And, you know, when we do book scrutinies, questions get asked. So my favorite response to this is, and I love this, and I've done this a couple of times, and it always works, is you just invite the SLT member not to watch a maths lesson, but to take part in a maths lesson. And whenever they see... Ooh. How hard it is, to, particularly if they're a non-math specialist, this is amazing, right? Because when they see how hard it is to disguise their lack of understanding versus if they can just sit there, you know, busy tricking, copying dates down and titles down versus if you know that whiteboard's got to be up in 10 seconds, the argument just disappears. But I just wanted to flag it up because I know some listeners will be thinking, look, I'd love to do this, but I've got to have evidence in books and, and so on. But you, so two things. One, you could say that, and then two, you're going to tell me some more book stuff's coming later. So that, that's good news on good news on that front. Um, can I ask you one more question on this, if that's okay? I am absolutely in love with this idea. I mean, you know I love using variation um, for, for a start. I am absolutely in love with this idea of using it in this early stage of kind of acquiring understanding of an idea. Um, I love that I'd not thought of this with the, the combo of using it with mini whiteboards and this prompt of let's be lazy. I think that is so, so smart. I absolutely love that as a way to motivate kids, but also just to do what variation theory is supposed to do to draw kids' attention to the critical feature that's changed and so on. I absolutely love that. My, my question was, would that, would you do that in the majority of things you were teaching kids? I can imagine it working really well with this, you know, expanding single brackets. Do you find it works with most most topics, roughly 50% of topics? How often do you find yourself using that approach? 37. <laughs> That's what I was hoping time, for, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, who knows? Um, I, I think where possible. Um, but also I think being aware that it's a form of scaffolding. Yeah, exactly. It, it is not. If you do this question and then you change a bit, change a bit, change a bit, change a bit, and then give kids a, a, a bit of work, which is which is different, doesn't mean they can do it. Yeah. Because I think I think John Mason talks about going with the grain and against yeah, yeah. the grain. When you go with the grain, great, nice. I know where we are. It's familiar territory. You've got to make sure they can go against the grain as as, as well. Um, yeah, where possible because I think it's a nice a nice tool. But if it isn't necessary because they've understood enough stuff. Then, just, then it shouldn't be needed, but I think where you can, it's great to, to highlight the differences, the similarities well, well, between questions. And what I love about it, and again, this is just kind of having listened to you speak about it a few minutes ago, but but this this goes to the kind of essence of why I use use these kind of sequences of questions, is you get the support and you get the challenge. So you get the support in the sense that they've got something to compare to. So you are changing one sign. So, okay, I'm not having to start from scratch, what, what can I use in the previous example to help me? So there's just kind of scaffolding support, but you also get the challenge of why. And this is why I talk about reflect, expect, check, explain. So before I actually work it out, what do I expect is going to happen here? What sign's going to change? What number's going to change? So it feels to me that, you know, you're already getting differentiation in early on in this stage of, of the process. Kids are experiencing different examples, sorry, different experiences, but you're not having to provide different materials. So that feels really powerful and to me. I love that. But then the final thing I was just going to say, Craig, is the reset feels really important as well. And I've been guilty of this, you know, um, just getting a bit too obsessed with these sequences 
and just making sure kids can do things without that previous question to refer back to that they can do it from scratch so it's really great to hear you saying every now and again clear the whiteboards here's a question from scratch what can we do with this so yeah, oh, love it. I've never taken as many notes if people are watching on the video. This is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> um, 